Welcome to Research Business Daily Report, where serious market researchers come for news insights and commentary about their field with information that impacts them inside and outside their organizations. Today, comments from many polling experts filled our video report yesterday about the just completed U.S. election. And today, we have a one on one interview with one of the industry's most accurate pollsters over the last two decades. He is John Zogby. RBDR is sponsored today and this week by QOAS is a self-service marketing research solution designed specifically for market research professionals. It's the only platform that delivers industrial strength, easy to use, unrestricted survey building blocks, many of them for absolutely no cost, provided by the 22-year industry expert Socratic Technologies. QOASIS is getting better with each new iteration. The latest just came out November 9th, and we'll discuss it and some other factors with QOASIS at the end of today's report. There are many pollsters with somewhat divergent views about the U.S. presidential election of almost one week ago, and the reason or reasons for the polling difficulties that became apparent on election night. We are fortunate to be able to turn to one of the field's very best and most accurate pollsters during the last two decades, John Zogby, who, by the way, has a new book. It's called We Are Many, We Are One, Neotribes and Tribal Analytics in 21st Century America. He told us that he saw definitive reasons for the problems that his peers had going into the election. Works. Okay. John, okay. Um, after the election results... After the election results came out last week, a lot of pollsters pointed to two things that they believe went wrong um, in trying to calculate and predict what was going to happen. One was state poll inaccuracy, and the other was the so-called hidden Trump voters. Uh, do you agree that those were the primary causes of what happened, or do you have a different point of view? I have a different point of view on both. Let, let's take a look at that quote, hidden Trump voter. I think that was just bad sampling, and it's not new. This is a problem I've had with many of my colleagues um, over the last 20 plus years, which is a, a tendency uh, to oversample Democrats and undersample Republicans. And so right on up to election day, uh, almost everybody's polls, nationwide especially, were coming in with 38, 39% Democrats 28, 29 percent Republicans. I know that that isn't America. That's never been America. There's there are more Dems than there are Republicans, no question. But it's really never been more than a, a three or four point differential. I always apply to weight for party. But I also have to tell you that as I applied weights for party, I never in my raw sampling ever got a nine point differential in my in my raw polling. And so what some may have said what might, might be a, a hidden Trump vote, I think was just simply an undersampling of Republicans, especially as we know that Republicans started coming home. And we could see that in the internals, you know, in the last uh, week or eight days. Uh, as to the, the statewide polling, I, I think we need to have reasonable expectations for what polls can do. I mean, projecting a winner or predicting an outcome to the percent, when you have as many as 12% telling you, I don't know who I'm gonna vote for the day before, I'm not even sure I'm gonna vote, or I, I, I will probably vote for the lesser of two evils, but I don't like either of these characters and I haven't figured out which one is the lesser of two evils. But I looked at the state polls, I obviously followed them very, very closely, and the directionals were right. So let's look at Pennsylvania and, and Michigan and Wisconsin, North Carolina. If, if I see that nine, 10 days before the election, um, Clinton was leading by 10 points, nine points, maybe more in, in those states, and then by the Sunday, Monday, right before the election, she's leading by 2.3, 2.4 in all those states. Something tells me something's going on here and that there are there's a direction, a trend, not enough to predict. I think only God does that, 
but enough to say, hey, uh, look at look at these pretty closely. That's why I wasn't surprised at all on Election Day. Okay. Uh, you made three points I want to go back to. Number sure. One, oversampling of Democrats. Um, what I saw and what a lot of other people saw on CNN and MSNBC and on Fox, uh, but particularly on MSNBC, I think, and on CNN on, on election night, was the premise that areas that were Democrat normally in those three states, Democrat in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, suddenly had turned red in rural areas. So if you oversample Democrats, but a lot of those Democrats become Republicans in that election, have you really oversampled Democrats? Well, we're talking two different things here. Okay. I could still be a Democrat and then decide I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. Right. And there were enough Republicans um, voting for Hillary. This is the conceptual problem I have. I consider political party to be a lead variable, meaning it's like a demographic. I inherited it from my parents, or I rejected my parents, or I live in Chicago, uh, or I live in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and my culture points me in a direction. But that's who I am. That's how I filter my information. That's as important to me as being a farmer, as opposed to a mechanic, as opposed to a, uh, a rabbi. Uh, party is a lead variable. My colleagues have always, ever since we've debated this, considered party to be a trailer variable. Who are you going to vote for? I'm for Trump. What are you? Oh, I must be a Republican. But five days later, I hate Trump. So what, I'm, what are you? Well, I guess I'm a Democrat. Bob, come on. Now, figuring that Trump got 90% of Republicans and Hillary got 90% of Democrats, figure for every missing point of a Republican, you're missing a point on Donald Trump's score. Okay. Now, in the past, we've talked <coughs> about the fact that for exit polling, there has been a tendency since around 2000 for Republicans to, uh, in, in large groups, be unwilling to talk to exit pollsters. Um, is that true? Yeah, to some degree, but it's not a conspiracy. Okay, and you know, I mean, say, it, you know, is there an actual movement? You know, the the National Association of Republicans who refuse to talk to exit pollsters. I don't think so. Sure, there are people here and there who say that they're they're not going to do that. But you know, the the and and look, the exit polls. There's no business ever using them to project a win or an election. You know, you're in the market research business and so am I. I love that exit poll data because it tells me why and who and what does it all mean and what pushed my buttons as opposed to, hey, I'm just as happy as anybody else to watch real number, how quaint, real numbers coming in on election day and, and basing judgments on that. Okay. Now you didn't serve anyone in this past election. But there is, is there any evidence you've seen that a good number of people uh, were not willing to admit to a pollster, whether online or face-to-face, or -face, that there actually was something they didn't want to admit to? No. I, look, Bob, we're only as good as people will talk to us and people will tell us what they're going to do. If they won't talk to us and they won't tell us what they're going to do, you know, we can't make assessments on the on the on the on the basis of phantom voters. Okay, it was the percentage of people who made up their minds last Tuesday any different from what it's been in other or more recent uh, presidential elections? Yes, uh, it was substantially higher. It was well into the teens. I mean, <coughs> excuse me, I've seen, you know, in state races, fifteen, eighteen percent tell us. I made up my mind in the last minute, seldom in a presidential race. But when you've got a choice among so many undecideds between El Diablo and La Diabla, um, sure, it's going to be much higher. Mm -hmm. And the fact that these two candidates were so uniformly disliked by so many people, that made it tougher for a pollster as well? Oh, it did. Oh, absolutely. But then, 
let's remember that we need to have, uh, and look, I'm not protecting anything because I didn't poll this race. And I've gotten the last five about as close as anybody has, has ever gotten. The business has changed and we need to uh, adjust our expectations for, for what pre-election polling will tell us. You know, we ought not be looking at, at um, you know, any biblical message uh, or something to, you know, for that bookie that's waiting outside in the, in the Lincoln, uh, you know, for our bet. Don't do that. Okay. And you just raised that point, which you raised earlier in our conversation here. And that is that polling now, it sounds to me as if it has moved into more of the general category of market research, which in my 23 years <clears throat> has always been highly directional, not predictive. And is that what's going on with polling? And if it is, that's a significant change. It's a significant change. Uh, to be honest with you, it's something that I've seen about polling for a long time. But I think that the, those who are engaged in political punditry, those who uh, do these projections, you know, and, and the sorcery sorts of things, and then change the projections every three and a half minutes on election night, I think they need to get real and to, and to realize what polling really tells us is about the culture, yeah. you know, and about who we are and, and how we make decisions and what directions are things moving into, not who wins by one half of one percent, although in my day I was pretty good at that. So definitively, if if polling is now more directional than anything else, what does that mean to your business and to the business of other pollsters? Because it has to be somewhat uh, impactful. Yeah, it sure does. And, and, and that is that we ought not to be looking at uh, one-dimensional polling to make our assessments. That horse race, who's leading? Oh, Hillary's leading on Sunday. She wins. Donald is leading it uh, on Tuesday. He wins. We're not doing that. There are too many variables out there. More importantly, what what's who's Hillary appealing to, and is she getting enough support? Is that message working or not working? Where is she falling down, and where are her strengths? And how does she adjust her campaign? And ditto for Donald, and ditto for everybody else. Including the pundits. And, and last question, um, if if polling is becoming that much more difficult and that much more directional and less predictive, uh, does that mean that if you're working for either a candidate or for an association or just a cause to really know what's going to happen and where you should put your eggs, um, does that mean that you need to do more polling because perhaps the electorate is... Uh, much more combustible and less sure of itself as time goes on, especially with all the things that happened in the last two weeks of the race. Sure. Things move very, very quickly. More polling is not going to hurt, uh, spoken as a true pollster. By the same token, though, um, I'm in malpractice if I'm telling some, uh, my candidate on Thursday, you got this in the bag. I'm, I'm practicing my profession uh, by telling my candidate, here's where you're falling down, here's where uh, you need to beef up your strengths. If you're not doing well among this particular group, you're doing well among that particular group. Either let's focus on the first group or let's focus on getting more out of the that second group. But th that's what my business is all about. My business is not whispering in a candidate's ear, you got this in the bag, or, you know, why don't you go on vacation because you're no good. And that's market research. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what you do for uh, for your corporate client. Yeah, yeah. Okay. John, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Bob. That's your Research Business Daily Report, sponsored by QOAS. It's a self-service marketing research solution for market research professionals. It is the only platform that delivers industrial strength, easy to use, unrestricted survey building blocks, and it's made available to its users for free by the 22-year industry expert, 
Socratic Technologies. QOasis's giant advance in DIY work is only getting better. If you've given it a chance, you can see why. And it's introduced its latest update back on November the 9th. QOasis has no question limitation or respondent number limit, and it can link you to hundreds of online panel providers who will help you target your audience properly. You can also gamify your survey versus several different internal components. And these services are actually expanding as we speak. And QOasis can also provide consulting and analytic services where needed. So Credit Technologist says of QOasis, it's where marketing and research budgets get a vacation. It is so new and positively different from other DIY services out there that its developers are still looking for users' input. So if you give it a whirl, and we think you should, you can contact them and give them your feedback. So now is as good a time as any to go visit the QOasis homepage, which is at q-oasis.com. Have a great research day, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.